Contested Bones, Part 6. We've been going through the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Um, it is available on the internet from Amazon sometimes, from uh, the publishers a little more frequently. That's what the cover looks like. Oh, yes. And I should have put uh, a book out because I brought one. The books that we brought last week have all disappeared, so uh, I don't know how many others um, haven't got them, but uh, uh, not of the box. It went completely disappeared. So, but there's uh, Christopher Roop, young man uh, who works with John Sanford, who uh, uh, is well known in uh, uh, in plant genetics, uh, invented the gene gun, among other things. Um, John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50, when he realized the impotence of evolution and the impact of genetic entropy, or sometimes known as devolution, which uh, le led him to be a short-age creationist. Um, then he had cognitive, cognitive dissonance with the, all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes and set out to investigate along with uh, Christopher Roop, who is one of his uh, protégés. Chapter one of the book discusses the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles, kind of setting the stage for the rest of the book. Chapter two talks about the textbook picture following Darwin's expectations, which is straight line evolution, one followed by the other, followed by the other, immo uh, immortalized by the painting that is now, well was, more broadly uh, uh, spread and now is not quite as broadly spread, but is still very widely known. The, bush, the field is now acknowledged, widely acknowledged to be more bush-like, and there are some paleontologists, evolutionary paleontologists, that state that the ascent of man cannot be traced. Almost all the fossils are contested in one way or another. Chapter three discusses Neanderthals and claims that they're human. Chapter four discusses Homo erectus and claims that it is human. Chapter five talks about Homo floresiensis, or sometimes known as the Hobbit, and it notes that uh, they are human as well. Chapter, uh, section two is talking about bones of the ape type, and it includes chapters six and seven. We'll cover chapter seven tomorrow, or next week, but um, <coughs> To set the stage, it says the ape-like hominin bones can all be reasonably placed within the genus Australopithecus. The genus appears to show a great deal of morphological variation, and so the partitioning of the genus into various species is controversial and unconvincing. The Australopithecus species are loosely referred to as the Australopithecines or Australopiths. Taxonomic splinters, splitters would like to argue that the Australopithecines should be subdivided into two or more genera, and that Australopithecus itself should be divided into several species. Extreme splitters would accept many of the following different Australopith-like species. Ardipithecus ramidus, known as the AR as the abbreviation rather than AU, which is next week's subject. Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, the more common one, the one we'll mainly be dealing with this chapter. Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus barels gazali, Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus prometheus, sediba. In addition, they would add the robust gorilla-like Australopithecines, 
Australopithecus Ethiopicus, Ethiopicus Australopithecus Boise, and Australopithecus Robustus. However, lumpers, and the authors put themselves in that group, would argue that these subgroupings are based upon relatively minor morphologic differences, often reflecting less difference, for example, than is seen between the bones of a male and female gorilla. We will consistently use the broader term Australopithecines to apply to anything similar to the basic Australopithecus type. The bones of the Australopiths are strikingly similar to the bones of modern apes, chimpanzee, bonobo, gorilla, orangutan, and baboon. We agree with the paleo experts who maintain that Australopithecus was a mainly quadrupedal animal like the living African apes, usually walked on all fours. Even when it came down to the ground, it still spent a lot of time standing and walking on all fours. And notice that the quote quotes somebody else as well. Um, we will sometimes need to use the terminology of the splitters when we discuss the bones that are claimed to be separate species or genera. For example, we will discuss a set of bones that were originally classified as Australopithecus, but were later reclassified as Ardipithecus and given the, given the nickname Ardi. That's chapter 7. The uh, Ardipithecus genus includes bones that are extremely ape-like and, and are very similar to the other Australopithecines, as paleo experts have noted. To keep things simple, we will accept the original designation of Ardi as an Australopithecine type, ape type. This second section describes Australopithecus afarensis, chapter 6, and Australopithecus rambidus, chapter 7. Australopithecus sediba will be described separately in section 3, what they call bones of the middle type. Chapter 6, Australopithecus afarensis, the full story about Lucy. And the quote that's given is the Hadar, and by inference, uh, Sturkfontein <coughs> material, that is Lucy's kind, consists of several distinct species which were previously jumbled together. So there's some question as to whether it all belongs in one place. That's by Peter Schmidt of the University of Witwatersland in uh, South Africa and um, Martin Hausler of the University of Jur Zurich. Everybody knows Lucy, but how much do we really know? Lucy is a nickname given to a partial skeleton discovered in 1974 in the Afar region of Ethiopia, therefore Afarensis. Lucy is the defining specimen of a hominin species named Australopithecus afarensis. Over 400 specimens have been attributed to afarensis, but most of these are isolated bone or bones or bone fragments. And to give you an idea, there's Lucy right there. And you can see that mm, there's a couple of hands. The rest of this is all just individual bones found in various direct uh, places. All in the same place? Oh no, uh, scattered all over. So they may not even be the same animal. I know, you're trying to build a case out of basically not much. Although the Lucy, Lucy skeleton is very incomplete, it is the only specimen that can be assembled with any degree of confidence. For this reason, the term Lucy and the term Afarensis are too often used interchangeably. Uh, to be clear, Lucy is an incomplete single skeleton, figure two, which we'll look at in just a minute. Afarensis is an extinct population of presumably similar individuals. Apart from the Lucy skeleton, Afarensis is only represented by a loose collection of isolated bones and bone fragments. And there's Lucy herself as we found her and as reconstructed. Take a look at the feet. <coughs> Lucy is the most famous hominin fossil and is considered by many to be the best evidence for human evolution. Lucy and her kind, Afarensis, are marketed as the perfect transitional species linking ape and man. Afarensis can be found in virtually every textbook in which human evolution is mentioned. Artist representations of a hairy, lifelike Lucy are shown in museum displays all over the world. 
For decades, Lucy has been vigorously promoted as our apish ancestor by all of the popular media outlets such as Discovery, PBS Nova, Time, National Geographic, Smithsonian, etc. If you were to take a survey of any random crowd of high school or college students asking if they could name any ape-like human ancestor, they would overwhelmingly name Lucy. However, it is likely that none of those students would have heard her full story. The nickname Lucy was coined when John L. Johansson and his team celebrated their discovery while they were listening to the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The skeleton is 40% complete, and depending on how you count the bones, uh, actually only 20% complete, taking into f account the missing bones of the hands and feet. Uh, forget that university. Textbooks claim that although Lucy and her kind lived for millions of years before modern humans, Afarensis has already walked in a fully upright manner, just like us. Textbooks and museum displays routinely show an artistic rendi rendition of Lucy having an ape's head but an anatomically modern human body with modern spine, rib cage, hips, legs, hands, and feet. And that was the figure we saw. The Lucy skeleton reveals the limb proportions and overall body size of an ordinary chimpanzee. Lucy was about three and a half feet high, had a skull that was about the size and general shape of a chimpanzee's and had the long arms and shortened legs of an ape. The Lucy skeleton has no hands, the legs are incomplete, and the feet are essentially absent. The hip, shoulders, rib, and spine are all fragmentary. Moreover, Lucy's incomplete anatomy is not readily validated by other afferences remains because isolated bones and bone fragments cannot unambiguously be classified as being the same species. As Johansson himself writes in his 1979 science paper that describes her findings, a number of skeletal elements found at Hadar, particularly some of the hand and foot bones, are either absent or poorly represented at other sites, which makes meaningful comparisons impossible. However, whatever meaningful comparisons between Lucy and other afarensis specimens have been, have been possible, they have confirmed Lucy's apish anatomy, that is, Lucy's baby. Such comparisons have further revealed an extreme level of anatomical variation in the Hadar collection of bones. This has sparked considerable debate within the paleo community. Did the afarensis bones represent a single species or perhaps two or more species? Although many of the afarensis bones are described as very ape-like, there are bones that appear to be a distinctly different species that in fact belong in a different genus. These out-of-place bones were acknowledged to be present from the outside by Johansson and his co-workers in the field, including Mary Leakey, who was working in Laetoli. Remarkably, both Johansson and Leakey classified the other species as a homo, that is human, and independently reported their findings in nature. This is the most shocking part of Lucy's story, discussed further in chapter 11, which we'll get to. This explains why some bones of the afarensis type have been re described as remarkably human, while others have been described as strikingly similar to those of chimpanzee. Nevertheless, because the human bones in the afarensis mix, mix were relatively rare, the overall anatomical picture of afarensis, including the Lucy skeleton itself, is an un unmistakably ape. If the Lucy bones are clearly apish, on what basis was Lucy assigned human hands, human feet, human knees, and human hips, human spine, and human posture? The answer is found in the human-looking fossilized footprints discovered soon after Lucy's the Lucy find was published. Um, figure three, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Lucy's feet are missing, but some claim she left human-like footprints. In 1976, two years after Lucy was discovered, a British paleoanthropologist, Mary Leakey, discovered a trail of fossil footprints prepared, preserved in a volcanic ash deposit, tuff, located in Laetoli, Tanzania. The footprint trail continues for a distance of nearly 88 feet and includes 70 footprints. The Laetoli footprints were made by at least three individuals, a child, an adult, and a juvenile, was walking in the footprints of the adult. All three were traveling in the same direction and it appears they were walking together. Uh, there's a mutation there. The ash deposits 
that preserved the footprints was potassium argon dated to be 3.7 million years old. Meanwhile, a similar dating method was utilized to date Lucy at about 3.2 million years old. And there is a picture of the footprints themselves. The, these are actually two different sites. This is the most famous one. This is another site, site S. And you can see that a human. Most importantly, take a look at the toes and how the big toe and the other toes are quite close to each other and uh, not like human hands or like chimpanzee feet. The Laetole footprints were found more than a thousand miles away from where the fossil remains of Lucy's kind were found. And they were dated to near, be nearly a half a million years older than Lucy. Yet Johansson strongly asserted that these footprints must have been made by his species, Lucy's kind. Johansson was convinced of this in part because at that time, paleoanthropologists believed Afarensis was the only hominin species alive in that era, based on the now abandoned single species hypothesis that we talked about briefly. A leading paleo expert at that time, Richard Leakey, wrote that Johansson's assumption was an audacious move that raised many eyebrows among evolutionary biologists. How do you know that those footprints were made by Lucy? Well, because there was only Lucy around, that's why. What made John Johansson's claim so audacious was not just the fact that the Laetoli footprints were the wrong age and in the wrong place, but they were unmistakably human, indistinguishable from the human footprints of modern humans. Nevertheless, Luce, uh, Johansson's extraordinary claim, linking Lucy and the footprints, eventually became academic dogma and popular wisdom. Outside the field of paleoanthropology, it has become widely accepted as a simple fact that Lucy and the Laetoli footprints are part of the same story. Since the feet were missing from Lucy's skeleton, Johansson could assert that Lucy had feet virtually identical to our own. If Lucy had human-looking feet, it was only reasonable to assume that Lucy walked erect and so had human legs, hip, and hips, and spine, and also didn't climb trees very well. This line of reasoning has driven the, the thinking of much of the paleo community ever since. Figure 4 shows a close view of a fossilized Laetoli footprint found in the volcanic ash tuff contrasted with the feet of human and anthropoid apes. A divergent hallux that is an opposable thumb-like great toe used for arboreal locomotion, grabbing limbs, uh, is a fundamental characteristic of all apes. The presence of a limb-grasping divergent hallux is such a distinct trait that evolutionary anatomists re regard it as the sine qua non of primate arboreality. It is very clear that the fossilized footprints from Laetoli lack a divergent hallux. They are totally discordant with the feet of any kind, type of ape. They're indistinguishable from modern hu human footprints, both in size and shape. As Owen Lovejoy, functional anatomist from Kent State University, explains, when we compare, uh, this should be in blue, the Laetolia prints to that of a chimpanzee, the difference is immediately obvious. The chimpanzee, which is a quadruped, still has a free great toe and that great toe extends out away from the foot and leaves a very distinct mark. On the other hand, when we compare the Laetoli print to that of a crime scene human print, they're virtually indistinguishable. The great toe is in line with the rest of the toes, and what this has done in the, in the human and in the Laetoli pr print is to create an arch. <clears throat> and that's a hallmark of typical modern upright locomotion. Bruce Latimer, evolutionary paleo expert, in a, expert on hominin foot anatomy, agrees, saying, when I saw those footprints being excavated, I thought, gosh, you'd lose these on a modern-day beach. They have an arch and a totally human gait. Tim White, who was working alongside Mary Leakey, also acknowledged their striking similarities to modern human footprints. Make no mistake about it, they are like modern human footprints. If one were left in the sand of a Californian beach today, and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. Morphologist and former research expert on the Laetoli footprints, Russell Tuttle from the University of Chicago, affirms, there's another mutation, 
uh, Tim White's evaluation, writing indiscernible features, the Laetology prints are indistinguishable from those of habitually barefoot Homo sapiens. Why weren't the fossilized footprints attributed to Homo sapiens or erectus? The answer has to do with the presumed age of these footprints and deeply entrenched evolutionary preconceptions. According to the Ape to Man story, the earliest humans did not evolve until roughly two million years after the Laetoli footprints were formed. Johansson and colleagues reasoned that since Afarensis was the only hominin species alive at that time, Erectus and Homo sapiens having not yet evolved, the Laetoli footprints must have been left by Afarensis. Since the footprints are anatomically human, Lucy's kind must have been an early upright walking ancestor to man. This explains why Lucy is shown in textbooks in various museums and zoo displays with an anatomically f human body and upright posture fully equipped with human hands and feet. Figure five is from a popular biology textbook which shows a picture of the St. Louis Zoo display of Lucy along with the famous fossilized Laetoli footprints shown in the backdrop. And there's your uh, textbook picture showing the statue and then the Laetoli footprints kind of photoshopped onto it. <clears throat> Foot and hand bones show afferences did not walk upright like humans. While artistic reconstructions tell one story, the fossil re evidence tells another. The actual skeletal remains of Lucy reveal that many of the critical bones for determining locomotor locomotory behavior are missing. Contrary to fanciful textbook and museum renditions of Lucy, the skeleton, skeletal remains do not include hands or feet. Since the discovery of Lucy in 1974, over 400 additional bones and bone fragments of the Lucy type have been found in the Hadar region. Approximately 37 of those are foot bones. Nearly 50 if we include those recovered since Johansson's early expeditions in the 70s. These bones provide direct evidence about the nature of Lucy's missing feet. They indicate Lucy's kind had ape-like feet. The most complete afferensis foot specimen is partial left foot from Hadar, designated AL333-115. Like the other foot bones from Hadar, it was found in isolation. Assuming that the foot belongs to Lucy's kind, what does its anatomy reveal? Johansson and those with him who promote Lucy as a hab habitual biped claim the far partial foot is human-like, as is necessary to support the claim that Afarensis formed the Laetoli footprints. It is interesting to note, however, that Johansson's team decided to frame their reconstruction of the Afarensis foot based on a human foot template, that is, specimen OH8. Um, recovered from the Old Vi Gorge, Tanzania. That foot bone was originally attributed to Habilis, but was later reassigned to Erectus. Not surprisingly, the end result was a very human-looking reconstruction. It uh, is this human-biased reconstruction of Lucy's feet that is widely promoted in educational systems and shown in museum displays. It is unfortunate that the general public has not been made aware that a large portion of the paleo community holds a competing view about Lucy and her kind's foot anatomy and locomotory behavior. For, for in instance, a team of paleo experts from the State University of New York, Stony Brook, which includes distinguished leaders in the field such as Tuttle, Tardio, uh, Sanute, Sussman, Stern, and Youngers, among others, insist Lucy was a predominantly a tree-dwelling Australopithecine ape that did not habitually walk upright. These scientists reject the human-like interpretation of the afferensis foot and take issue with the reconstruction that was modeled based on a human foot. When the partial foot attributed to afferensis is reconstructed on its own merits based on the anatomy seen in the bones, without preconceptions, researchers come to a very different conclusion. Now remember, these are evolutionary researchers mostly, so they don't, they're not trying to make this into a creationist argument. In the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, evolutionary anthropologist, anatomist, Jack Stern and Randall Sussman performed a comprehensive analysis of a number of hand and foot bones attributed to afferences from Hadar, including the partial foot. With regard to the foot bones, they described distinct traits 
that can only be understood as adaptations for grasping such as occurs in arboreal locom locomotion. They go on to say there is no evidence that any ex extant primate has long curved heavily muscled hands and feet for any purpose other than to meet the demands of full or part-time arboreal life. Sussman describes the partial foot in a separate journal saying the proximal phalanges of AL33115 are in morphological, in overall morphological pattern like those of the African apes. Sussman and Stern's final conclusion was that Afrensis could not have been a strong walker. Corroborating evidence revealed additional non-human features of the feet, including divergent halluses used for limb grasping typical of tree-dwelling apes. Sussman affirms, and there's another mutation, the present, uh, presence of an opposable hallux in afferensis, AL333-115, as has been confirmed in at least two other studies by Tuttle and Deloison. In an annual review published in 2012, paleo-expert Craig Stanford affirms these earlier evaluations by Stern and Sussman, published in 1983, acknowledging that their assessment of afferensis as an arboreal adapted species is still valid and represents the consensus view held by paleoanthropologists today. Interesting that what's being taught is not the consensus. Additional findings confirm afferensis looked and moved like tree dwelling apes. At a lecture given at the meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists in 2005, William Harcourt Smith of the American Museum of Natural History and Charles Hilton of Western Michigan University explained that Lucy's kind lacked a human arch and were flat-footed like modern apes. In summarizing their research, Scientific American author reports, Australia's, uh, Australopithecus afferensis almost certainly did not walk like us, or by extension, like the hominids at Laetoli. In 2011, Johnson, uh, Johansson and colleagues published an article in Science reporting the discovery of a bone of the foot, which they attributed to afferensis, uh, single bone. It was the fourth metatarsal bone of the midfoot. They argued that the slight curve in this bone suggested that Lucy's kind walked upright like modern humans. In response to this publication, the popular press exploded with news articles proclaiming to the world that the latest, the latest proof that Afrensis walked upright. The mainstream media was full of headlines like the one in Nature News. These bones were made for walking. Human-like foot arches strengthened the argument that Australopithecus, Lucy, was not a climb. Similar, National Geographic News, and then they go on to list a bunch of stuff. And there's a picture of the actual bone itself. A little bit of an arch there. P.J. Mitchell et al. published a follow-up study a year later that challenged the validity of the earlier paper. Here's what they concluded in a more thorough study published in the Journal of Comparative Human Biology. Overall, AL333-160 is most similar to the fourth metatarsal of eastern gorillas, a slow-moving quadruped that sacrifices arboreal behaviors for terrestrial ones, mostly on the ground. This study highlights evolutionary misconceptions underlying the practice of using localized anatomy and or a single bony element to reconstruct overall locomotor behaviors and of summarizing great ape structure and behavior based on non-statistically representative samples of only a few living great ape species. In summary, these researchers criticized the previous study as being bad science. The earlier research was based on an incomplete comparison which failed to include three out of the five great ape species, only compared two of them. If they had done a more complete analysis, they would have observed the strong similarity of the fourth metatarsal uh, fossil to that of eastern gorilla. Perhaps the most troubling is that the media sensationalized the first paper, which was heavily criticized, but ignored the more comprehensive rebuttal paper. Just as there are bones which show that afferensis had ape-like feet, there are bones which show that it had ape-like hands. 
In the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Stern and Sussman d described the afferents as hand bones from Hadar. Stern and Sussman go on to describe the small bones of the wrist, the pisiform and the trapezium, which are markedly different between humans and apes. They note that the afferensis pisiform resembles the pisiform of apes and monkeys, and the trapezium closely resembles the corresponding joint in chimpanzees. These paleo experts have observed, based on certain diagnostic features of the distal radius, the large bone, the lower arm bone closest to the wrist, that Lucy had a locking wrist and stabilized the joint. This morphology is classic for knuckle walkers, not for humans. Skipping uh, a little bit further, the Laetoli footprints, an evolutionary enigma. This leaves us with a mystery of the Laetoli footprints, which Scientific American describes as the world's oldest whodunit, or un an unsolved mystery. If neither Lucy's kind nor any other Australopithecine can be credited with having made the Laetoli footprints, where did they come from? Aware of this problem, Russell Tuttle, former researcher of the Laetoli footprints, suggests a far-fetched idea. In any case, we should shelve the loose assumption that the Laetoli footprints were made by Lucy's kind. The Laetoli footprints hint that at least one other hominid ro roamed Africa at about the same time. They might say one other human-like hominid. Might there be a more reasonable explanation than this? Is it possible that humans formed the human-looking Laetoli footprints just as the anatomy suggests? Tuttle actually acknowledges that this would be the most reasonable interpretation, he writes. If the G footprints were not known to be so old, we would readily conclude that they were made by a member of our genus, Homo. In chapter 12, we will learn that if the potassium argon dating method, uh, the word if probably doesn't belong in the, in the sentence, the potassium argon dating method used to date the Laetoli footprints is highly inconsistent and is often in error. So we're going to get into radiometric dating in chapter 12. Dating Lucy and the other Laetoli and the Laetoli footprints. It turns out that Johansson's various attempts to date Lucy's bones resulted in different ages depending on the dating method. Initially, Lucy was dated using a volcanic ash layer just a few meters above where the bones were excavated. The volcanic ash was dated using the conventional potassium argon method, but there were difficulties with this method resulting in a failure to obtain a reliable age. But because Johansson was determined to have Lucy be the earliest pre-human ancestor, he chose a stratigraphic method that gave him the date he wanted. It was not until years later, in the early 90s, that the ash layer was redated using the argon-argon method, and a date was obtained that seemed acceptable for Lucy, approximately 3.2 million years old. Skipping over a lot of stuff, uh, those of you who got your books can read the stuff I'm uh, skipping over, but it's all good. Um, knee joint attributed to Lucy's kind, similar to orangutan. I'm skipping over that. The reconstructed, uh, reconstruction and function of Lucy's hip is contested. Um, suppression of the competing interpretation of Lucy's kind. Outside of the paleoanthropology community, the world has been persuaded that Lucy was essentially human from the neck down and walked like we walk and left the Laetoli footprints. It is unfortunate that so many people are unaware of the ongoing controversy and the fact that a large fraction of paleo experts reject Lucy and her kind as a habitual biped. Regarding afferences, paleo experts Cartmill and Smith acknowledge that uh, virtually every observation has been called into question by one side or the other. Um, skipping on, body size and limb proportions of an ape, skull jaw and face of an ape, shoulders of an ape, rib cage of an ape, and there's a whole paragraph behind each one of these. Spine of an ape, hip of an ape, hands of an ape, feet of an ape, knee joint of an ape. Conclusion, Lucy's kind is mostly ape. Contrary to the human-like representations of Lucy promoted by the media and found in textbooks and museum displays, the actual fossil evidence consistently shows that Lucy and her kind are not transitional forms. Afarensis was an ordinary ape, very similar to chimpanzees and gorillas. Then it talks about Richard, Richard Leakey, and then it discusses Peter Schmidt. 
After examining the cast of the Lucy skeleton, Schmidt observes, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone had talked about Lucy as being very modern, very human, so I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed that the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. What you see in Australopithecus is not what you'd want in an efficient bipedal running animal. The shoulders were high and combined with the funnel-shaped chest would have made arm swinging improbable in the human sense. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> It wouldn't have been able to lift its thorax for the deep kind of breathing that we do see when we run. The abdomen was pot-bellied and there was no waist, so that would have restricted the flexibility that's essential to human running. Lucy's distinctly ape-like nature is defended by numerous experts in the field who have published in highly respected peer-reviewed scientific journals, such as the Proceedings of the Nat National Academy of Science, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Nature, Science, and more. In this light, we must ask why Lucy is still consistently portrayed as having a human-looking body and human postures if there was no controversy to speak of. Certain parts of the answer is, certainly part of the answer is found in the power of the paradigm, but we suggest that another major factor is actually Lucy's discoverer and chief advocate, Donald Johansson. As we'll see in chapter 11, Johansson was brilliant in his marketing of Lucy and in using Lucy to redirect the trajectory of the field of paleoanthropology. Many others joined his side, perhaps because they realized the ape to man paradigm was in jeopardy. The biggest surprise in this chapter turns out to be that homo bones were found among the afarensis bones, as Johansson originally reported in Nature in 1976. He initially described the Hadar site as mixed bone beds containing diverse taxa, including baboon bones, australopithecine bones, and human bones. Having humans living alongside Lucy is obviously a problem for the ape to man paradigm. Not long after this, Johansson's colleague, Tim White, who incidentally figures in the next uh, chapter, uh, persuade him, persuaded him to change his story. Johansson eventually agreed and then began to completely rewrite the ape to man story. Johansson's new story was that all of his bones from Hadar and all of Mary Leakey's homo bones, and also the human footprints from Leatole, belonged to a single species, single new species, that is, Lucy's kind. He attributed all of these bones and fossilized footprints to a new species that he named Australopithecus afarensis. He claimed that all the smaller bones that appeared to be apes were the females of the new species, while all the larger bones that appeared to be human were the males of his new species, a phenomenon known as sexual dimorphism. This retelling of the story was pivotal in rescuing the paradigm and established the current ape to man timeline, with Lucy at the base of the hominin tree long before man evolved. This also establishes Lucy skeleton as the key transitional form, making it the most famous fossil discovery of all time, and himself his, its discovery and the hero of the story. This reversal is not widely known. It is rarely, if ever, mentioned in textbooks or the media. However, it is easily confirmed by reading the scientific publications of that time or relevant books written by paleo experts. Review papers have al also summarized this history, though not always impartially or completely. And there are references for all of that. Afarensis appears to be a mixture of bones belonging to the different species. Schmidt and Hausler make this observation in the Journal of Human Evolution. The Hadar, and by inference the Sterkfontein material, consist of several distinct species which were previously jumbled together. This is the full story about Lucy and her kind that the public has not been told. In chapter 11, we show that the bones that appear to be humans are really are human and need to be distinguished from Australopithecus or ape bones. We conclude that Lucy and her kind are not a credible evolutionary link between ape and man. The majority of bones that are classified as Lucy's kind, afarensis, are pure ape. Afarensis is an extinct population of apes very similar to chimpanzee and gorilla. And then, after the chapter was written, the latest developments, Lucy's kind, Afarensis, is claimed to have lived three to four million years ago. Johansson and colleagues have claimed for decades that Lucy's kind is the ancestor of all later hominins, including Erectus and Homo sapiens. 
Yet now we are finding fossilized foot, human footprints from Trachylus in western Crete, outside the known geographical range of pre-Pleistocene hominins. that are dated to approximately 5.7 million years old. This is significantly predates the 3.7 million year old Laetoli footprints. This suggests that human and humans already existed over two million years prior to the time of Lucy. This is true that Lucy and her kind, as well as Ardi, Habilis, etc., can no longer be proclaimed as the ancestor to all later hominins, including man. But in what seems to be a last-ditch effort to preserve the ape-to-man story, the researchers offer at least one alternative explanation for the Trachylus footprints that is quite humorous to imagine. We must also entertain the possibility that they represent a hitherto unknown late Miocene primate that convergently evolved human-like foot anatomy. Now we are supposed to believe that two different early primates lineages evolved anatomically modern human feet totally independently, convergently. Supposedly the European primate lineage evolved human feet several million years before Lucy's kind did. Now my take, I think the chapter does make a convincing argument that Australopithecus afarensis is an ape with some th human bones thrown in. They do seem to have ape-like characteristics. I think one could, if one had to, use them as primitive hominins with many ape-like features. Um, but they are close to other apes and close enough, I think, to have descended from them. Remember the bush theory of human evolution? The bush theory of evolution is okay, but you have to have a main stem, or at least several main stems. Common descent requires that some populations had continuous ancestor-descendant relationship between apes and humans. That's kind of the definition of common descent. Now, you can have the traditional straight line that gave rise to the pictures that, uh, of the ape-to-man transition, uh, with, of course, apes staying at one level or perhaps diverging slightly. You can have more than one line, perhaps three or four even, uh, with various branches that take off at various times. You can have one that suddenly goes up, sort of um, Stephen Jay Gould style, where we lost all of the fossils in that intermediate. What you cannot have is two sets that don't interact with each other. If that happens, you have to hypothesize some kind of a branching earlier and before. And the quicker it happens, the, uh, it starts to look kind of like the dog ate my homework, especially when you can't find the intermediates. Now, absent that, that simply is not a an evolutionary scenario. It's not a common ancestry scenario. Now, we put Neanderthals up either in the top or in the bottom. They're close enough to humans to have been, uh, uh, to have intermarried with them. Um, we have Homo erectus, which again is close enough to humans. It could be put on the top, it could be put on the bottom as a degenerative thing. You can have uh, Homo floresiensis, which branched off from Homo erectus probably, although there are people who try to say no, it was really Australopithecus. Or you can have it branching off in a creationist type scenario. And finally, uh, you can have Australopithecus afarensis as being a branch off of uh, humans, or perhaps it is a branch off of the ape stock. And that's where we've gotten so far. We're going to go with Ardipithecus next. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Um, this uh, Laetoli uh, scenario uh, raises in my mind at least a, a question that is seldom asked, uh, and that is, are the findings something that occurred later 
than the dating of the rock. And uh, this, this, of course, raises a serious questions about the uh, Precambrian fossils. In fact, one expert, expert in his name is here <coughs> in my mind right now, uh, mm -hmm. raises that question once, you know, because they find all these microscopic fossils in the Precambrian. Uh, that they're not sure that those things didn't live later than the deposits. Is it possible that the Laotoli tracks occur later, but quite a bit later, before the uh, ash layer, or whatever it was, finally became cemented? Uh, or did it become uncemented under some special circumstances and so on and re-cemented and, and that, uh, but the, the uh, you find this more or less implicit. If you find a fossil in a certain place, it's, it's whether it's a trace fossil of some kind or an uh, ant nest or something else, you say, oh, no, that, that's, that dates, you dated the, the, the rock. And it may be much, an ant nest much later. Those fossils that you find in the Precambrian may be much later. They have living fossils there, you know, uh, protozoa found, you know, hundreds of meters down in ground and uh, living at present and uh, so on. Uh, so th this question, uh, I think, uh, Leia told the, uh, that, but that question is never raised. And, uh, and it seems to me it's, it's an alternative that they would probably find uh, uh, a solution to it. I don't know why. Uh, uh, only very rarely is this raised, and it has been raised in connection with uh, Precambrian fossils. Uh, just because you find them in the Precambrian, and there are all kinds of living organisms there at the same time, how do you know those were fossilized at the time that they date the rock? and not a, a much later fossilization process. Well, as a matter of fact, I think one of the things that should be done in this kind of situation is to uh, take specimens from different areas of the, of the same ash bed and uh, see if you get the same date for all of them. And I, um, you need to, you know, we, you need to carefully study the depositional picture there, of course. I, but that's I'm, I'm not quite confident that you'd always get the same date even. I, there was a time when I, when I thought probably you did and it's just a characteristic of the bed itself. Um, but after seeing, after seeing this happen multiple times where, oh, well, we, we can't accept this date, well, let's try it again. Um, at a certain point, the dates become more theory-driven than, than data-driven. Which, from a standpoint of an ordinary scientist, does not sound very good. Paul, um, who wrote this uh, book? Just a minute. Yeah, no, no. We're gonna we're gonna let we want your voice for posterity. Who wrote this uh, book, and where is he at? Um, the book is written uh, by. Uh, Christopher Roop and John Sanford, and it's uh, it's written by uh, it's uh, published by John Sanford's uh, personal publishing company. John Sanford being, uh, if you're not familiar with him, a uh, uh, plant geneticist that. Uh, has been somewhat innovative. Um, he worked at Cornell for a while. I think he still has a uh, um, like a research professor or something like that designation, or emeritus research professor or something. So I mean, you know, once you Any get idea, tenure, they can't follow you. Idea why you wrote this book then? Uh, why he wrote the book? Yeah. Well, actually, the prologue tells you. Uh, basically, um, and that is that he had um, uh, 
he came to the conclusion that uh, evolutionary theory was bankrupt in terms of creating um, uh, any kind of species at all. But he's not a, he's not a, a bone expert. Go ahead, take the, take the mic. He's not a bone expert. Did you say he was a plant guy? Yeah, he's a plant guy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, I think Martin Lubinow probably had more, uh, more of a, uh, a professional background than these guys do. Um, I think that they have probably done a more thorough um, uh, checking of the literature than Lubinow did, but that's partly because there's more literature to check now. Or when was this uh, published? This book. This public. This book was published, I think, last year. Either that or this year, I believe it was. Uh, let me just see if I can find the imprint on it. Uh, yeah, 2017. So, uh, I I do know that they're aware of Lubinow's book because they quote it in a couple places. So, I think they've tried to incorporate everything that they felt that was valid of Lubinow's book. So, you know, it's kind of one of those building on the shoulders of giants kind of things. Yes. Um, What's the name of the collection of the Lucy type bones? What's the name of what? The collection of the Lucy type bones. Uh, so, somebody had a collection at some place. All, all the pictures of all the bones. Yeah, the, all the pictures of all the bones. That is probably in a museum in Africa. Well, I, you had a name for that collection. It was the name of the collection. Oh uh, boy. I'm not sure what it was. It was the, probably the Hadark collection or something yeah, like Hadar. that. Yeah, Hadark. So, um, I, I th if I understood correctly, you, you said that there was some Lucy-type bones, but there was also some Homo bones in, in the Hadar collection. Is that right? That's correct. So in Lacey's original work, they were finding human and ape work. That's right. And, and, and yeah, in, in, in both Johansson and Leakey, but one of the things that, uh, that Johansson did was to say, no, they were all actually uh, Australopithecus afarensis. So my, my question is, um, when you're looking at bones, how do you know which bone is one and which is the other? Well, that's an interesting question. I suppose that one of them looks more like um, uh, an ape of some kind, and one of them looks more like human. And see, if you're an evolutionist, you expect things that are halfway in between, and so they're going to be difficult to classify. So, but the statement is said that there is some homo bones, and, but there is also some Lucy type bones, or Lucy kind bones. So, yeah. on what basis is that? I, I mean, it's people are making the statement that they see different types of bones. So right, right. So it's based upon metrics of bones and then what categories they fit into. Is that right? That's so in right. other words, you can tell. Sometimes the curvature of the bones helps. You know, uh, the knuckle fingers, we're going to run into more of this later on where they're going to be arguing about how the curve bones are curved in, that, in the fingers and therefore that, that was more uh, advantageous to to grab onto uh, limbs and stuff like that. Uh, so there's, there's subtle differences between the bones of humans and those of apes. So is it possible to, to um, take, I don't know, say fourth metatarsal, okay? And um, although I don't know how much of a difference there would be with fourth metatarsal, but let's say that there's a difference between human and apes. Uh, and to be able to look at, you get all of the metatarsal bones, you know, all, all, all bones from, you know, different parts of the body. And then what you do is you, you sort of do a, what's it called, where you let the data suggest the categories themselves. Um, you can, and, and th that raises another interesting question, and that is to see if you're finding a bone over here and you're finding another bone over here, do they belong to the same creature? 
Right. But what, but what I'm saying is, is if, if, for example, if you had a box and you had human bones, and you had dog bones, okay, and you know you got this rib and that, you know this rib, you know rib number one of the dog and rib number one of of the human. I could imagine if you have you know like parts of a hundred human humans in there and parts of a hundred dogs in there, you could actually sort them out and say, wow, these all match, these all sort of go to the same, and right. these match. So you could actually go ahead and separate them. Is that is that what's being done with the Hadar bones? Well, that's what is being attempted to be done, and I think that what you'd have to do is to say, is that valid by, you know, taking a bunch of humans, um, a bunch of whatever the Australopithecine is supposed to be, t say Lucy is the kind of the, the prime type, although that doesn't help you with hands and feet, and then uh, and then take, um, let's say, gorillas, chimpanzees, various, you know, eastern gorillas, western gorillas, mountain gorillas, whatever, and uh, chimpanzee bonobo. And there are actually three different varieties of chimpanzees as well. Um, and, and, then, and then try to see if there's enough similarity between them to say this really is more like gorilla-like, this is really more chimpanzee-like, and so forth. And one of the things that happened on that one bone is that if you compare it with chimpanzees and humans, it's more human than chimpanzee. But if you compare it with chimpanzees and more Eastern and Eastern gor gorilla, apparently it's more like an Eastern gorilla. So you, you, you have to know your field before you, you're going to be able to sort it into whatever category it should be in. Okay. Yes. <coughs> one thing I was wondering, uh, <coughs> I was surprised to learn, or perhaps I'd heard it before, that there were no foot or hand bones recovered for Lucy. Yeah. Uh, what The footprints are assumed to have been made by Lucy. Correct. Uh, one can, to a certain degree, predict the stature of a human by the footprint. Right. Does it, foot a, does it fit a three-foot human? Um, my understanding is no, and it's actually ought to be taller than that. But, you know, if, if you see, if you start out by knowing that there's only one kind, then you just fit the Well, pin. of course. Uh, and and what it, makes it really, really choice is if you assume that all the males are more human-like and all the chimpanzees, uh, the chimpanzees are more female, uh, females are more chimpanzee-like, sorry ladies, uh, then you can do, uh, then you can, uh, then you can explain, uh, you know, a dimorphic population. Well, what I find so striking is that the practice does everything but use good science. And yet it's so widely accepted because it fits. Yeah, yeah. It makes a story regardless whether that story has real independent support. I, I think that was one of the things that kind of half surprised the people who were doing the research is that, is that uh, the foundations are not nearly as secure as you would think they would be if they were, uh, uh, you know, if you were doing science in any other field, you'd say, we don't know. And you'd probably have to leave it at that. But, you know, human ancestors, well, we do know kind of the general outlines, and so we can kind of fit them in <coughs> where, we, where we need to. It depends on how much confidence you put in the theory. If you have lots of confidence in the theory, then you're pretty impressed by what you see. If you don't have much confidence in the theory, you kind of just <coughs> shrug your shoulders and move on. Seems like it's a relatively important standard to meet to, uh, to simply say this is an assumption. Yeah. But, but see, if you say it's an assumption, then it's implicitly saying that you don't have to buy this assumption. 
Well, obviously. And that it, just listening, it sounds like Johansson was as motivated to become recognized as the savior of human evolution as he was to present the best in science. Now, I think that's a, regardless of what side you come down on, I think that's a fair observation. It is, except for one thing. If you believe that evolution is the best science, and there's no daylight between those, then you don't make a choice. But you used a very critical word, believe. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's interesting, the people who, uh, the people who find this difficult to believe are sometimes labeled skeptics. In any other field in science, skepticism is a good word. Forgive me for this final observation. It's kind of like designing a modern airplane based on all these flying saucers that people know a lot about. Yeah. Um, that's it. We're having fun with microphones here. I, I just thought you might emphasize that there's no question that those late totally things are human and so divergent because the ape foot is you know, a widespread space there between the, the, the first Call it toe. <laughs> I guess you'd call it a toe. And, and the rest, I mean, it, this is, uh, I think nobody is disputing the fact that uh, Laetoli uh, looks human, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no, so obvious. Is. It's so obvious uh, because of that. But uh, I'm just amazed that they haven't tried to uh, say, well, it's a later uh, deposition from that, from that particular layer. That's, it being out for them, they don't use it. Well, I, the problem is that if they start monkeying with the, uh, with the stratigraphy and they start saying that, well, the, uh, the, car the uh, potassium argon dating method isn't really reliable, um, then uh, you undercut the foundations of the entire edifice. But I think this is a, some monkeying that needs to be done in a broad sense in the whole paleontology story. Yeah. Yeah, it does. In fact, I would say that there's, you know, there's some raw research that needs to be done that hasn't been done. Uh, you know, one of them is to find out how, uh, how easy it is to reset the argon-argon uh, clock. I suspect it's not very easy, and, and, and that's why you can get old ages from, is because if you have excess argon, it's hard to drive it off. But, but the contamination problem is, is uh, even more serious. Well, uh, excess argon is contamination that you're supposed to get rid of when you heat the uh, uh, lava to a certain point. Uh, but, you know, tough usually by the time we first see it is tiny shards of glass-like material, you know. It, it's, it's small crystals that, that have been kind of shattered into very small, very small pieces. And there's no guarantee that they were hot enough to get rid of all their argon, which is probably why you can get various states depending on, you know, where they came from and how hot they were. And, uh, uh, but you see, if, if, if you don't have argon-argon dating and you don't have potassium-argon dating, which is why argon-argon dating was invented in the first place, is because they didn't trust the potassium-argon dating, then um, you don't have dates for most of this material. And if uranium lead turns out to be a problem too, then you don't have dates for practically all of the material. Argon, argons, you still have a contamination problem. Yeah. 
Well, you have you have a problem of that we don't know if it even gets reset or not. And if you don't reset it, then it, then the age uh, age you get is meaningless for dating the actual deposition of the stuff. In which case, um, most dates become vaporware. And I think that's kind of where they're going to be going in chapter 12, basically. Anyway, go back next week and we'll talk about Artie, which actually has a slightly better preserved skeleton.